My name is uh, Luka Cernkovic Fries, and I'm the CEO and one of the founders of Peltarion. And we've been working with neural networks since about 2000, started the company in 2004. Before this, uh, before neural networks were called deep learning, when they were much smaller. But we uh, worked commercially uh, worldwide with a bunch of companies. We helped Tesla with battery optimization, uh, NASA with some logistics for the space shuttle, and sort of various types of uh, applications. So, what our passion always has been, and especially in uh, now in modern days with the technologies becoming much more useful and much more applicable to more and more fields, is how do we make this technology available to more, to regular companies, not just uh, Amazons and Facebooks and Googles. So, there's Tons of stuff about AI in the news every day. Some of it good, some of it a bit sensational. Uh, and uh, various people are talking about it in really big terms. Huge investments are being made uh, in the US on the commercial side, uh, in China, in academic research, long-term projects. Tons and tons of money is being poured into it. And yet still, a million people die each year in car accidents, and about 500,000 are incapacitated or seriously injured. This is something that AI could solve, obviously through self-driving cars, but not only that, but by helping us planning the cities, understanding traffic, improving traffic flow, and so on. Crop disease last year destroyed 15% of the Ethiopian wheat production, created a famine. This was actually a small-scale uh, eruption. Uh, in the 50s in the US, uh, it destroyed 40% of the crops. Again, this is something that AI could help with, because prediction is the key for preventing this, to early see the science and to block it off. A million people each year die after radiation therapy. And it's because it's uh, too slow, it's too inaccurate, and it's too expensive. So the time from when a doctor manually de uh, detects cancer in a MRI scan or CAT scan to the operation is so long that the tumor has time to grow or move, and uh, they irradiate the wrong thing. So with all the talk about AI, why isn't more happening? It's not like this is just recent. When we're talking the recent development in AI, we're talking about the last five, six years. So why, why hasn't this been solved? Well, there are a couple of problems with AI today. The first one, it's super difficult to find people who know it. Uh, there's a great study just recently a couple of, uh, published a couple of weeks ago by Element AI that did a survey of data scientists and AI experts in the world. And their conclusion was that there were 700,000 job openings for data scientists. There were, they estimated that there were 22,000 data scientists with AI expertise worldwide. But there were only 5,400 AI experts who could actually take something from a prototype into actual production. Universities haven't caught up yet, and the demand is just increasing. Second thing, these systems, they run on specialized hardware, which are, they're expensive, but they're also a pain to deal with. Your typical GPU that's used for this uh, can take, say, 16 gigabytes of memory but your data sets are in terabytes, or in worst case, petabytes. Uh, there are 50 companies today developing deep learning specific hardware. So for a normal company today to start to invest in something, it becomes super costly because it's a lot of management around this hardware and you don't know which hardware will be to available tomorrow. And third, perhaps most important, is the lack of tooling. So for traditional software, engine, uh, software development, we have like 50 years of experience of 
and best practices of how to build products. We have uh, tools for it, for version control, configuration management, continuous integration, and so on. For AI, nothing or very little exists. So basically, a company has to build everything up from scratch. And since these systems are data-driven, you don't know beforehand if it will work. So for a regular company to start finding these super too hard, hard to find experts, uh, invest in specialized hardware, which may be obsolete tomorrow, and to build up a big software stack, it becomes too, too, uh, way too expensive. Also, the tooling that exists today, uh, you have the likes of TensorFlow, MXNet, and those who are super powerful, but you need an expert to really use them. Or you have uh, Air as a service, very simplified, can be used by almost anybody. Upload an image of a cat, it tells you it's a cat, which is lovely. We couldn't do it a couple of years ago, but it's sort of limited. And uh, I will have to uh, disagree a bit with the previous speaker, Adrian, that uh, transfer learning is a solution. Yes, uh, if you have a start with a model that has been trained on CAT, you can absolutely retrain it a bit to classify hotel rooms. But those are very, um, sort of a very narrow category of things of classifying images, classifying large-scale images. You couldn't use the same model, for example, for tumor detection, or you couldn't use uh, transfer learning to say if Expedia wanted to combine images and ad text, so different data types and so on. So absolutely, transfer learning does help in a very narrow number of fields, but not for most business problems. So. And uh, today, if we see, the technology is used by big global tech companies, primarily. You also have some super unicorns like uh, Tesla and Netflix who are using it at production at scale. But generally, lots of people are experimenting, building small prototypes, building uh, simple things, but very, very few have them actually in production. Okay, the monitor was dead, but okay. Uh, yeah, uh, another point is that with these super expensive experts, if you look at uh, the breakdown of the work they do, less than 10% of their, their work is actually building the models and doing the actual machine learning thing. They're spending all their time building stuff around. This was true before the current deep learning era as well. Uh, the thing is that what has changed is that uh, time that they spent with building models and doing the intelligent stuff has been reduced and the overhead of having to deal with GPUs and other hardware and stuff like that has increased. So, what needs to happen? First, better tooling. And when I say tool, I actually mean platform. It needs to be integrated. The problem today is that you have loads of different fairly complex uh, open source libraries which you try to connect with glue code to build a common system. And it's usually very difficult. It's not scalable and not maintainable over a long time. The second thing, uh, the field has been very dominated by uh, research and technology. And we need to get a bit more commercial and industrial thinking into it uh, for make, to make it viable for uh, companies. So e even if you can build a great model build a great AI system today, it will be of little use if you have to rebuild it a month later because the software, underlying software has changed. So more of thinking about what's the time to value, what's the total cost of ownership and so on to make it viable. The third thing is that like digitalization or any other paradigm shift, this is something that needs to be uh, understood on a more general level. So the, uh, AI is not primarily a question for the IT department. It's something that a whole company needs to embrace and discuss. And for that, the level of general education and uh, training of leaders, pol politicians, journalists, and so on. Because again, even uh, though Google, Amazon, and those guys, even if, if 
I re truly believe that try they're trying to make the world a better place, but it's not a healthy situation where only a couple of global tech companies control this technology. But we believe in expanding that. So, our take on tooling, uh, which is the point we're focusing on most, is actually that you don't need tools, you need a platform, you need something more integrated, something that takes care of the whole process. And uh, what this is what we've been working with, this is our contribution to uh, making this technology more available to everyone. So it's a platform that allows you from start to finish, uh, build, import data, pre-processing, visualize it, build your models, train them, and put them in production. And there are three major points that we uh, tried to address. The first one is making it more accessible. Uh, in practice, it means that more people, we try to solve the problem where not only the 5,400 uh, AI experts can use it, but a wi uh, wider base. And that those experts that do use it focus on the stuff that they're good at rather on building plumbing around. Uh, it's focused on co collaboration. Today, building these systems is very much a single-player exercise. Uh, we try to make it multiplayer. The second thing, making it scalable in practice, meaning that typically for these systems you want to run hundreds of experiments, thousands of experiments, everything that has to be managed. And a lot of work today, if you're going to build an AI product, goes up in sort of building the version control system, trying to see how configuration management, how will it work with different versions of the math libraries and so on. And it takes care of that automatically. Uh, the third thing is making it commercial grade. Deployment at scale. And this includes not only just that, which you do just with one click, get an API, but also that there's a link back so that you can see when you have something in production that five years later you can go back, revisit the model and see what did we do, why did we do it this way, or retrain, connect it to exter external data sources and so on. And of course, maintainability and reliability over time. Today if you write something for the existing uh, libraries like TensorFlow or MXNet, you're building against a very experimental software stack that is going to change. So that abstraction level is very low, both in terms of software, but also to the hardware it's tied to. So this is a level above. So you can change if MXNet overtakes a TensorFlow tomorrow, you can use that as, as your compute backend. Or if there's something third, you can use that and you don't have to rebuild your models, you don't have to retrain it, you, you don't actually have to do anything. Uh, in commercial terms, it's reducing the time to value a lot. Uh, so things that usually, literally takes months for AI experts to build, so you can build in minutes or hours. And the total cost of ownership, reducing it, so that you don't have to worry about updating uh, your software stack uh, ever so often because there are changes in software and hardware. But most of all, and uh, I would really love to demo it for you, but we're releasing it first in the uh, end of April, it's that it's so much fun to use. It's, uh, it's sort of you eliminate all the boring plumbing stuff that you can do and you can just do experiment upon experiment. Just It's a graphical platform, so it's super easy to Okay, you want to see how do I combine an LSTM with an autoregressive CNN? Okay, just a couple of blocks, connect it, press play. And while it starts to train, start on the next experiment. Everything that you do will be version control, documented, so you don't have to worry about any of the sort of boring logistic stuff. Uh, a couple of examples of what people are doing, uh, early customers are doing on the platform, uh, Telenor and Traffic Verket built a traffic prediction system based on mobile data. So they have data from mobile masts and they're trying to predict uh, how many cars, and speed of cars and so on, in order to improve traffic uh, safety. Uh, Storm Geo 
uh, a Norwegian meteorology company. Uh, are, uh, have a weather model platform, which is uh, 100,000 times faster and 10,000 times cheaper than a traditional weather model. So it takes milliseconds to use uh, deep learning based. Uh, one of the sort of instrumental things into preventing this uh, and detecting early detection of crop disease are accurate weather reports and getting very fast updates. Third example, brain tumor segmentation, uh, ELECTA, uh, using it to uh, build neural networks that se detect tumors from MRI and CAT scan images. And they got some, some really, really good models. They're down to uh, accuracy as the best human uh, doctors, and it's done in milliseconds. So the goal is eventually to have it uh, real time when they do the radiation therapy. So they get a video stream where they see the tumor. Really cool stuff. But, of course, this does not only apply to world-saving problems. Uh, so my wife is a choreographer, and she asked me, okay, so if AI and deep learning is so super cool, can it be used for dance somehow? So we thought about a bit about it. This was back in 2016. And we use the Kinect sensor to record uh, five hours of modern dance and then train the neural network to produce new choreographies. Now this was published as a pap uh, paper in a conference and it took months to do. Uh, now it's, it's really a joy to see when you see a master student can build one of these systems, build such a model in just seconds just with drag, drag, drop, play. But to give you as uh, the results. So after 10 minutes of training, it's just, yeah, just random, nothing. After six hours of training, uh, it sort of knows how to move, but it's reached my general incompetent level of dancing, sort of. <laughs> very stiff and uh, very insecure. But, after 48 hours, it has become a master dancer who can generate choreographies at will, and infinitely many. Um, so it's not just for advanced problems. Okay, thank you.